Welcome to Local Bites, the podcast of local futures, dedicated to the revitalization of cultural and biological diversity and the strengthening of local communities and economies worldwide. In this show, we'll be featuring critical voices and inspiring examples from the global movement for localization. Welcome to Local Bites, tracking the rise of localist movements and ideas from around the world. I'm Brian Emerson. The topic of this episode seeds of resilience, seeds of sovereignty. Humanity has lost nearly three quarters of its agricultural biodiversity in the last century. Now, in the face of an increasingly volatile climate, conserving the remaining seed diversity is a matter of survival. In this episode, Local Bites interviews ecologist and renowned seed conservationist Dr. Dabal Deb on the value of traditional seeds in an unstable world. Dr. Deb argues that traditional seeds are vitally important, not just to ensure food security, but also for protecting local food sovereignty against the corporate control of food systems around the world. Dr. Deb shares insights from his work conserving and sharing hundreds of indigenous seed varieties in eastern India. He also talks about why ecological farming, a communitarian ethos, and localization are all key components of his conservation efforts. I reached Dr. Deb near his research farm in Odisha, in eastern India. At times, the sound quality is a little rough. Apologies for that. Dr. Dabal Deb, welcome to Local Bites. Thank you. I was thinking that we could start by having you describe your work in seed conservation in eastern India. Maybe you could tell us about your conservation farm, Basuda, maybe what its purpose is and the kind of work you do there. Primarily, I mean, I started my crop genetic diversity conservation work with rice. But we also try to conserve many other crops as well, that prominently rise. As an ecologist, when I came to know about the the general ignorance of agriculturists and policymakers and conservationists about the value of conservation of crop genetic diversity, I thought that there must be something to do about it. Although I'm not an agriculturist by training, so I just dabbled to to try to conserve some of the remnant varieties, varieties which are still surviving on the farmer's fields. And with that, this attempt, Vihi, the, the seed bank, was born in 1997. So I started with this, the seed bank, for free exchange among farmers. Vihi was to collect all the varieties, save them for the farmers, and then distribute it from the seed exchange center for no exchange of money, but seed exchanged for seed. And that's how Vihi was born. And later, when we felt the need of conserving them in situ, that is on-farm conservation and replication of some of the rare varieties, we started Basudha as a farm, a conservation and a demonstration farm, where not only those heirloom crop varieties would be conserved in situ, that is grown every year, but also to demonstrate the efficacy of ecological agriculture, to demonstrate that sustainable agriculture and sustainable production of all kinds of food crops is possible with zero agrochemical inputs from our side. So that's how Basudha, the farm's name, was born. Basudha literally means in Sanskrit, the earth mother, Gaia. And Rihi, the seed bank's name, means in Sanskrit, rice. So that was all started in 1997. I was initially interested in just taking stock of how many varieties of rice are still surviving in a country where the documented number was 110,000 varieties of rice. In the state of West Bengal where I started working, the recorded number of varieties was 5,500. And when I started working in 1996, I was astonished to find that more than 92% had got extinct which means there were just about 250 or 260 varieties still remaining in, in the state of West Bengal. Then I started collecting and planting them on our farm. And today, after 17 years of effort, we have been able to conserve 946 varieties of rice from different states, mostly from Bengal, but also from some other states now. And I hope to add another few hundreds in the future. That's impressive. Could you give us an idea of some of the varieties that you've helped conserve? Yeah. Uh, to an agronomist and an agrobiodiversity uh, student, every single crop variety or land race, every single variety is unique for one or the other characteristic. 
It could be color, it could be aroma, it could have certain certain nutritional properties or very important agronomic characteristics like certain resistance to a particular pest or a particular disease agent and also certain characteristics which enables that particular variety to withstand drought or flood or salinity. And these are the characteristics which none of the genetic engineers have yet achieved uh, by transgenics. But the ancestral stock of these varieties generated and created in the hands of unnamed, unknown farmers have these kind of characteristics. So one variety could be able to withstand 12 feet deep water. And I have about six varieties uh, which can withstand 12 feet deep water and another 14 varieties which can withstand easily about 5 to 6 feet deep water. You have to harvest this uh, rice on board a canoe when they're mature. These are the types which actually challenge the knowledge of our modern agronomists who have failed to produce any single modern high-yielding variety which can withstand this kind of deep water. Conversely, there are about 50 varieties in our accession which can withstand drought and upland, dryland conditions, which means that they can produce an adequate quantity of rice. Of course, they are not particularly high yielding, but they can, they can give certain amount of yield despite zero irrigation. Just one spell of rain is enough to sustain this. Similarly, we have in my own collection six varieties which can withstand seawater salinity, so they can grow in seawater. These are the amazing qualities, but these are only agronomic properties. Apart from that, there are many other cultural, nutritional properties like many of the aromatic varieties. I have in my own collection something like 88 varieties which are very strongly aromatic and uh, medicinal properties uh, like black rice varieties which have very high quantities of antioxidants and many varieties which have very high iron content and very high vitamin B1 and B2 and B4 contents. So I would say every single variety has certain special property which uh, cannot be replaced with any particular modern variety. I imagine there are a lot of people, especially a lot of businesses, when they hear about the variety and the different characteristics that you found, start thinking about patents um, and ownership yes. over these seed varieties. Could you say how you deal with that? You, you mentioned already that you distribute them for free, not for money. But could you say a little bit more about what you do there? Yeah, unfortunately, after this you know, the WTO regime, everyone is thinking about uh, appropriating biological materials for profit and staking some kind of intellectual property rights and commercial profits out of it. But fortunately, Indian Patent Act actually prohibits this kind of patenting and biological material excepting those cases which are not produced with usual common biological phenomena, which means, you know, a genetic engineering. For the genetically modified organisms or transgenic organisms, including rice, plant, those could be patented. And the risk lies in the fact that although you cannot take a patent on a traditional land race, you can take a patent on a particular gene or a gene complex responsible for a particular trait like salinity tolerance or a particular resistance to a pest. So a company can take a patent on that particular property or the gene complex and then incorporate those genes into a novel transgenic variety and then making a business and then prohibiting the traditional farmer from using that particular variety which was the donor. That's what we call biopiracy and we definitely oppose this at the community level, the national level, which is the statutory level, but we also produce a publication which is copyrighted in the name of the community to bring about a public knowledge system. We published a book documenting more than 480 varieties of rice and documenting all these, you know, 35 agronomic and cultural properties of those varieties and then copywriting in the name of the farmers who donated them or are cultivating them so that no patent can be taken on those particular varieties because they're all prior public knowledge. And now we are trying on behalf of a cluster of organizations in India, including OFI, that is Organic Farmers Association of India, and 12 other organizations who are trying to bring out a publication containing more than 1,000 varieties of rice. Later, we are focusing on other crops as well, uh, which would incorporate about 50 characteristics, which are scientifically documented for each of them, and then producing it as an open knowledge system. 
So it's something like copyleft for all the farmers and researchers, but copyright against any corporate sector to make profit out of this genetic material and the body of knowledge incorporated. Making sure that the genetic diversity is in some sense owned by the community. So that it remains a common property in the hands of the of the people. So it becomes the seeds commons and the knowledge commons, keeping it away from the corporate sector. I wanted to talk a little bit more about why it's so important to protect crop biodiversity. Well, of course, for the agronomic properties, as I mentioned, pest resistance and disease resistance and withstanding different kinds of marginal environmental conditions like drought and flood and salinity, for which we have to go back again and again to the repertory of our folk crop varieties. This forms the genetic basis for development of any new crop. But in addition to that, we have many other cultural importance too. Biodiversity, especially agricultural biodiversity, has also fostered cultural diversity, including food cultures of different places. So in Europe, for example, we used to have thousands of varieties of grapes, which actually gave rise to the diversity of cultures of wine. In the case of rice, we have many folk varieties, which apart from the direct use value, different rice varieties are cultivated for the aesthetic appeal of, for example, they have characteristic colors. The rice hull has different varieties, have different colors. Gold, brown, purple, black. And all of these have an aesthetic appeal. And there are hundreds of farmers who are fascinated with these kind of colors, unique colors, which are not you now common. In addition to this, different aromatic varieties have also many cultural values associated with diverse religious ceremonies and cultural festivals. Many of them are very local. So several varieties are also grown for their <clears throat> ritual value, as well as culinary value and gustatory preferences. So different varieties may be a short cooking time, some long cooking time. Some could be preferred for pop rice, some for ordinary rice cooking, some for sweets like rice pudding or rice cakes. So different rice cultures have also evolved based on particular rice varieties. Just one quick follow-up. So climate change is a major topic of discussion and concern for a lot of people these days. You've clearly mentioned some traits that might be useful to hang on to to deal with climate change and yes. an uncertain future. Could you say a little bit more about the value of yeah. a diverse crop variety? Yeah, thank you variety? for focusing on that. Yeah. Before the climate change adaptation talk uh, came a bandwagon, we have been telling people and agricultural scientists that the traditional folk crop varieties are our best bet against climatic vagaries. If it's too late rain or too early rain or too much rain or no rain at all, we have certain varieties of rice perfectly suited to that condition because those varieties, those land races were developed by farmers over centuries and centuries of breeding and empirical knowledge. And they made those varieties to co-evolve in their own particular eco-location. So those particular varieties are specially adapted to local soil or climatic conditions. And these are the varieties which can be used as the primary shield against the impending climatic apocalypse. So when we know that another few centimeters of the rise of the sea level will flood many of the coastal lands, uh, which will go out of production overnight. Those are the places where we can introduce certain salt-tolerant varieties of rice or other crops which can withstand that sudden salination of the land. Or if there is a long spell of drought, we can still have certain varieties which can tolerate that condition or sudden flood, you know, flash flood or seasonal floods. And we have hundreds of such varieties which can withstand that. Our task is to identify those varieties conserve them, and then distribute and introduce those varieties to those areas where they are most suitable, rather than depending on particular silver bullet technophilic solution to food security. That's why folk crop varieties are so important to prepare for this kind of climatic vagaries. Of course, we cannot expect that you know, if there is a sudden 40 degrees increase in certain place or it's a complete freezing in a place. We still can grow rice in that area. But we do have varieties which can withstand a much wider range of climatic conditions than any of the modern varieties. That's the strength and importance of those traditional varieties. You noted earlier how much agrobiodiversity we've lost. What drove that? 
What are the main threats to crop biodiversity? Essentially, it's the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution was actually promoted by a kind of statistical propaganda and a speculation that the food situation in most poor countries, including India, would be very bad, as if you know, Indians would die of starvation unless the food productivity increased. Based on that kind of scare, and everyone was scared because Big Brother was warning you of the burgeoning population, which is a fact, and an impending food production deficit, which is a speculation. Based on this kind of speculation, the Food Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and the U.S. government invested huge money in building institutions for developing high-yielding varieties of cereal crops. The mandate was to develop those cereal crops, which require a huge amount of external agrochemical inputs. The two foundations, the Ford and the Rockefeller and the World Bank, were all specifically interested in strengthening the Green Revolution in areas susceptible to communism. The Green Revolution, the term itself was coined as an anathema to the Red Revolution. So they aimed to stop political turmoil in specifically those areas by locating the international crop research institutions such as the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines and the CIMMYT, Maize and Wheat Research Center in Mexico. Another objective behind founding those research centers to propel Green Revolution was to ensure gene flow from the gene-rich South to the industrialized North to foster agro-industry in the US and Europe. Both these objectives, that is, of keeping away the Great Revolution and to ensure gene flow into the North from the Southern countries, were more than successful thanks to the earnest support from all national governments of the South, including India. That was a thrust that pushed to extinction most of the crop genetic diversity. The first breed of high-yielding varieties did give bumper yields in wet paddy farms with adequate irrigation. Yet the same varieties had to be replaced with a series of new varieties in subsequent years because they showed prominent yield drag. None of the Green Revolution varieties have ever shown considerable yield stability compared to any locally adapted folk rice variety. For example, if you take any uh, folk rice variety, the yield could be very low, say 15 quintals per acre, and you have a high yielding variety which gives about 40 quintals per acre. But in four years, the yield of the Green Revolution variety would slump down to less than 15 quintals, could be 10 quintals, 12 quintals per acre. So that's not yield stability. Yield stability is the single most important characteristic of the traditional varieties. Now, aside from the yield stability, none of the Green Revolution varieties have ever been successful in marginal farm conditions, which I have already mentioned. If there is a long spell of drought or an upland area which is not irrigated or deep water land which is seasonally inundated with, say, 5 feet to 6 feet deep water or coastal salinated areas, where is the role of the Green Revolution? There is not a single variety of modern high yield or green revolution variety, despite 60 years of rice genetics research, which has been successful to survive, let alone yield, to survive on those marginal lands. Now, considering that about 40% of India's arable land is marginal, the green revolution has failed to improve productivity of any of those marginal farms, where traditional locally adapted varieties alone can grow. So it's a lie that the Green Revolution and agricultural modernization, I mean technological modernization, has actually brought us or will bring us salvation for food security, or that the Green Revolution has really salvaged the poor. The problem is that because of this push by the national governments and the international institutions like the World Bank and foundations, we have already lost more than 90,000 varieties of rice in India alone over the past 30 years. In West Bengal alone, the recorded number of varieties that existed prior to the Green Revolution was 5,500, of which 4,800 varieties were shipped to the International Rice Research Institute in the 1960s. And today, we have no more than 300 varieties left on the farmers' fields. That's the scale of genocide that have taken place over the past 60 years since the Green Revolution. And now the farmers are dependent on the seed supply of the seed companies on the market. So then, you're a strong critic of the Green Revolution and industrial agriculture. 
you're also a strong advocate of more locally based agroecological farming systems. What is agroecology? Could you describe that for us? Simply put, it's the ecology of agricultural systems. Some people also prefer the term ecological agriculture. When we say ecology or ecological, it actually connotes taking care and taking account of the entire diversity of the system. So when you talk of an agricultural ecosystem, it incorporates not just the crop species, but in addition, all the kind of associate species of plants and animals. That includes all insects, earthworms, spiders, reptiles, frogs, mammals, birds, everything, every living thing, but also the interconnections, the linkages, the links of, say, for example, prey and predator. So the rice may have certain pests, you know, maybe two pests are are living in that particular rice field, say two pest insects. But then we have to have natural system where there would be a plethora of natural predators, natural enemies to those pests as well. Now, if we don't eliminate those predatory animals like insects and birds and lizards and frogs, which all eat those pest insects, we are retaining the integrity of the agroecosystem. And as soon as we spray pesticides to eliminate those pests, we are also knocking off a series of other organisms which would be beneficial, which are friendly organisms, friendly by way of eliminating the pests by nature, but would have certain other functions like pollination you know, like bees and wasps and bats and butterflies and moths. Now, when we apply pesticides, we are also knocking off unknowingly or deliberately all those organisms. So when you talk of agroecology, we are talking of the integrity of this entire system by retaining all the species and the genetic diversity of each species, uh, whether it's rice or legumes or insects and also the micro-ecosystems diversity within the agro-ecosystem. For example, within the paddy farm, we may have a few puddles of water here and there, which would be the breeding grounds for certain crops, or there would be some hedgerows or shrubs, which would be the nesting and breeding grounds for certain spiders and uh, reptiles. So we have to maintain the whole ecosystem and a system of agriculture which sustains this integrity of the ecosystem is ecological agriculture. Once that ecological agriculture is practiced, then we don't need agrochemical to control the growth or virulence of any disease or pest. Agrochemicals came in agriculture just about 60 years before, but the age of agriculture is more than 10,000 years. And people have survived and the agricultural systems, including the crops and their pests and their natural enemies, all have co-evolved over 10,000 years. The strength and viability of the co-evolutionary force is much, much stronger than any new agrochemical that we can imagine and invent today. In your scholarly work, you've made the distinction between economic efficiency and ecological efficiency. Could you compare industrial farming with agroecological farming in terms of these efficiencies, the economic versus the ecological efficiency? Scientifically, the yield is defined as the quantity of output per unit of input. If you consider this uh, industrial agriculture, you can get, say, 20 quintals per acre of some crop But you have to pump in so much of nitrogen fertilizer, so much of phosphorus fertilizer, so much of pesticides and herbicides, and of course, water for irrigation. FAO's own estimate shows that this input figure has gone up, and India government's own figure also says that. The input figures are continuing to grow up and up, uh, not only by by price-wise, but also quantity-wise. But on the other hand, the crop output absolute yield, absolute output of crops is also declining. So the FAO, I mean Food and Agriculture Organization's report of 2010, admits that cereal production in the Green Revolution areas have already stagnated and now the productivity is decelerating. In contrast, in an ecological agriculture, the entire amount of external inputs is zero. It does not require any external inputs. All these pests and diseases are controlled by nature, by the complexity of the natural ecosystem there, because you are depending on the diversity, one of which is providing potassium nutrients to the soil, 
another is giving nitrogen fixation, another is providing phosphorus to the soil, another plant may be driving off the pest insects and so on and so forth. And you have these all kinds of animals which can take control of the disease agents and pests. So you don't have to invest anything into the imports, uh, external imports. So even by that definition, your input is virtually zero and you get three quintals. But in another case, you have input of five units and you get five quintals. So by that definition, the yield of the industrial agriculture with external inputs is less than the ecological agricultural system where input is almost zero. There comes the ecological efficiency. Um, you, in some sense, touched on this already, but people who are actually really quite genuinely concerned about hunger and malnutrition think yes. we need industrial agriculture to feed a growing world population. How would you yeah. respond to them? Just two points. One is that we always focus on production alone. Productivity and production of food is not the solution alone. It's also the question of distribution. In Amartya Sen's language, it's the entitlement of the poor, the entitlement of the poor producers to food security, to, to food access, and their ability, the financial ability to buy food, to access food. And the second is that it's a corporate myth that is perpetuated by the food politics of today, and it pays every business to perpetuate this myth, that all the traditional crop varieties are, by definition, low-yielding, low-productivity crops. It was very deliberate coinage of the term high yielding varieties. So that regardless of this actual performance of the feed is called high yielding. So semantically it conveys that any variety which is not high yielding variety is definitely low yielding. The fact remains that there are dozens of varieties which actually out yield or outperform in terms of yield any of the modern varieties despite zero agrochemical inputs. I have on my own farm about a dozen such traditional varieties which can out yield any of the modern high yielding varieties. But even the definition, the very definition of yield is distorted. The focus is on only grain yield. But if you focus on the total ecological production of the ecosystem using ecological agriculture, X unit of biomass per unit of area of the farm, then it's highly productive, more productive than industrial agriculture. There are ample studies to indicate that when you use monoculture, the productivity of biomass in that same unit of farm would be enormously reduced. The main focus on yield and green output is another kind of monoculture of the mind, which does not count the production of many other types of biomass on the farmer's fields. So that includes the straw yield, paddy straw, which is very important economically and ecologically as well. The paddy is used for thatching roofs, it's, it could be a very good cattle fodder, and nobody counts the reduction, a drastic reduction in the straw yield. The second is that even apart from the rice, the traditional ecological farm or ecological agriculture used to be highly productive in terms of biomass production. So in the same single agroecosystem, we would get more than 180 different crops a year on the same plot of land. Most of them would be food crops, but there would be medicinal plants, there would be uh, condiments and spices, could be fodder, grasses, could be non-edible structural elements like bamboos for construction, for different kinds of handicrafts. And there were aquatic food production systems. So there could be paddy come fish come crab come shellfish culture. So you grow fish and paddy and shellfish all together. Today, with the Green Revolution, we have eliminated all these kind of ecosystems and the diversity of the food production systems and the species diversity and genetic diversity altogether. So it's all monoculture of rice, only rice after rice after rice. So this is what Vandana Shiva calls the monoculture of the mind. And it's the same developmentality, that's the same model of development that is truncating and minimizing diversity and homogenizing the system to produce more quantitatively, more of one particular item, just to feed one particular industry. Okay, so I wanted to spend at least a few minutes focusing on the contested science surrounding GMO technologies. There are many claims offered to the public about the benefits of GMOs for the environment, for dealing with climate change, for solving hunger, malnutrition. So as an ecologist and a seed conservationist, 
what do you make of these claims about the benefits of GMOs? And why are you so concerned about GMOs? Uh, benefits that's always, you know, hyped on the media and also in the public advertisements of the corporations. The benefits are all potential. They always say it's potential benefit. But the actual benefit is yet to be seen. The problem is that all the potential benefits are based on the assumption that transgenics, transgenic crops are necessary because those benefits are nowhere to be found in the conventional agriculture. And this is again a corporate lie and it's completely unscientific. For example, when we talk about, you know, beta carotene containing rice, golden rice, uh, which is hyped to, to solve the problem of vitamin A deficiency. This is uh, a good example of scientific short-sightedness and corporate hypes. First of all, we don't need rice to solve this vitamin A deficiency. Least of all, to import rice, which is invented or manufactured by billions of dollars of investment over decades. We already have a much better solution to solve this vitamin A deficiency in the form of both cultivated and uncultivated, cheaply and abundantly available plants. We have hundreds of plants which are harvested by villagers from the wild. So, for example, Ipomia aquatica is an uncultivated wild plant. The leaves and shoots of this plant contains 50 times higher vitamin A than the golden rice. And colocasia, the yam, the tender shoots of colocasia, contains 200 times more vitamin A than the golden rice. So, we can see that there be from 20 times to 50 times to 200 times more vitamin A content in even uncultivated widely available food crops and food plants. So why is it necessary to promote this vitamin A uh, rise rather than enhancing the availability of those plants to the poor? This is a policy blindness in favor of corporate profit. So this is one. The second is that even if we assume that there is certain property of a certain characteristic of a genetically modified food crop, which is uh, nowhere else to be found, I mean, there is no cheaper alternative or so on, the, the risks, inherent risks of GMOs outweigh that potential benefit. The levels of uncertainty, scientific uncertainty inherent in all GMOs are on molecular level, that is genetic level, epigenetic level, organismal level and ecological level. So, for example, there are signal transduction errors. I mean, these are highly technical genetic terms and the genetic engineering companies take advantage of this difficulty of the technical terms. Because if you say that signal transduction errors, which is the most prominent error in GMOs, then general people won't understand it. So, they take advantage of this general ignorance to this kind of uncertainty and then they promote this as a novel technology and uh, magic. So, signal transduction essentially means that the gene which is inserted into a GMO either fails to produce the target protein or overproduces the protein. So if it fails to produce the target protein or express in expression of the gene, it's called gene silence. And this gene silencing very often occurs, especially when more than one transgene is inserted. And there is not a single GMO that has been reported that does not encounter this kind of gene silencing event. The opposite is just the reverse. That is overproduction of the protein. That is it's called overexpression of the gene. And so instead of one unit of protein that is desired, uh, you may produce, you know, maybe two million units of this for a length of time. And then there is transgene co-suppression. That is that particular gene, the transgene suppresses simultaneously one particular gene, a flanking gene, and also the gene of the native organism, of the GMO itself. And there are all kinds of uncertainties inherent in it, uh, with the result that the GM crop, like a BT, BT cotton, for example, the toxin gene that is designed to, to produce to control the bollworm is not produced in the first place. That is, no BT toxin is produced because the toxin gene is silenced. Or maybe variable expression of the toxin gene. That is, the gene is expressed. That is, the toxin gene is produced in a tissue which is irrelevant. For example, if the BT toxin gene is produced not in the cotton bowl, but in the roots and the leaves, then it doesn't matter whether this BT toxin is there or not. Because if the cotton bowl does not contain the toxin, 
it will be attacked by the pests. And this is exactly what has happened repeatedly in India. And the result was a huge loss of cotton. What about the health effects of GMOs? The problem is that there is no such available data, concrete data on the health effects, because no scientists can receive any permission from the GM corporations to make this kind of experiments, because each of them have to sign an agreement that they cannot publish their data without the approval of the seed companies. So none of these results, if they are adverse, I mean, they are proving adverse effects of any of the GM crops, they will never see the light of the day. That has been the topic of a special issue of Scientific American, where a dozen of scientists actually reported this is exactly the case. That the seed companies don't allow such studies to be published without their own screening, the whole results. And the scientists are even prohibited from sharing their own raw data with other scientists without the approval of the seed business. We cannot rely on this kind of science and scientific truths for our own food security and health security. Until the GM science is in the hands of open public scientists with integrity, completely out of control of the corporations, then only we can rely on certain test data and publications. So until that happens, I'm not going to believe in any single word which is published by the seed corporations in favor of GM crops. Some scholars and activists suggest that there's a a structural connection between localization and the protection of diversity, or conversely, between globalization and the erosion of diversity, including biological, agroecological, and even cultural diversity. Do you see a connection between your work in agrobiodiversity conservation and localization? Yes, absolutely. From the beginning of my conservation effort, including rice genetic diversity conservation, I have seen that unless the local people, the local farmers, the local producers and the local communities are involved and giving importance, significance to their heirloom crops or the local biodiversity elements, whether it's sacred grove or a pond ecosystem or the trees or medicinal plants available in that, that particular village, and that's also involved with the local cultural system. That's why we are talking of the interface between cultural diversity and biological diversity. And we have also mentioned about the food cultures of the local areas, in you know, different areas, whether it's the different wines or different uh, rice puddings or rice cakes and different uh, methods of rice cooking. Until that takes importance in people's consciousness, they are not going to conserve those rice varieties. Thousands and thousands of crop varieties were conserved by the local consumers and local farmers because they were also culturally valuable, whether for aesthetic value or for gustatory preference or for agronomic, other different you know, economic and agronomic values. Once that system of common property nature of seeds, of forests or the water resources is disintegrated, then there is no coming back. Because then the disintegrated community is reduced to a few individuals, all atomized individuals. Everyone is going for their own maximization of profits until you revive the communitarian ethos. So that is intricately related to this kind of globalization of market economy, globalization of the mainstream economical concepts at the expense of communitarian ethos, the commons, whether it's the crop diversity or any other kind of natural resources or even their own cultures. And this is why we find that wherever there is a globalization and the McDonaldization of culture in country after country, in community after community, we find faster and faster disintegration of the local economy and, and a faster degradation of the environment and a rapid disappearance of the crop genetic diversity in those, specifically those areas. And conversely, in those areas where people are still concerned about their local crop diversity and biodiversity, those are the people who are still resisting the lure of consumerism and the market hegemony. So it's definitely connected. More localization means uh, ensuring the conservation of biodiversity on all levels. One of the arguments connecting localization and diversity is that when local farmers are attending to their diverse dietary needs and the diverse dietary needs of their community, the landscape is more diverse. But when Absolutely. they're serving global markets, the demands are different and it changes the landscape as well. It simplifies the landscape from a biological perspective so that they start growing just one or two crops at quantities greater than would be needed by their household or their community. 
So export is structurally required for that model. So Yes, absolutely. Just to draw on this, you know, the previous example of the vitamin A uh, containing plants, in Orissa, at southern Orissa, we are, where we are making this study with three tribal communities, we find that we have documented more than 80 different plants, uncultivated white plants, which are harvested by the hunter-gatherers and uh, even this, you know, the local cultivators from the forest and from the, from the wetlands. So they have a much more diverse diet and more nutritious diet, rich in all kinds of, diff- of vitamins, of minerals, proteins, than any urban diet. In a modernized farm, even if it is not monoculture, it depends on just a few crops. So maybe rice, maybe potato, and maybe just another vegetable. In contrast with an ecological farm, which depends on about 180 different crops, including food and non-food crops, this is enormously more diverse. And that definitely takes care of food security and nutritional security and health security because they also grow many medicinal plants. Uh, they also grow many structural items, which the modern farmer has to buy from the market, whether it's bamboo or other structural materials. So economically, ecologically, and nutritionally, this is the diversity that used to be in practice over thousands and thousands of years uh, on all continents, excepting Antarctica, of course. And this is the system of food security and ecological security, which are being demolished by the globalization of the market economy because the market promotes you know homogenization of this complexity for maximization of profit i'd like to ask you what can listeners do to help address some of the challenges you've talked about today in terms of the loss of uh, agrobiodiversity essentially it's just two points one is that keep all the seeds of your own heirloom crop varieties in your hand alive and unpolluted with modern hybrid varieties or GM varieties and genetically modified crops and so on, so that the unique genes, the the genome of your own crop is not changed. And the second is that don't sacrifice your economic freedom, cultural dignity and political sovereignty over your own production system or production ecosystem to either the state or seed companies for any short-term gain. Dr. Dabaldab, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Local Bites, the podcast of local futures. Listen to or download other episodes of Local Bites or subscribe to the podcast by going to our website, localfutures.org. And thanks for listening.